dual act, because he was a complete autodidact who made really polemical work, really poor work, and I was making kind of, you know, I was the lyrical dandy, basically. And much of the early work I did in the 90s was dismissed by the, there was a kind of very intense political <laughs> squad that evaluated artwork. And the early work I did in the 90s was, you know, the surface elegance that is in my work. Um, and the kind of, you know, the editorial rhythms that are not about disruption, but about, you know, massaging the musical beats or about articulating rhythm were seen as suspect by some people. Um, and I was like, why does politics got to be ugly? Um, and also we live in a world that's, you know, about, I, I'm trying to refract something that's, um, you know, I'm trying to re refract, you know, the interior and the exterior at the time, but at the same time, to use the cliche, the personal and the political. Um, and I don't think those things are mutually exclusive. So yeah, I think that um, cutting also for me is really, um, in a lot of ways, a physical embodiment of filmmaking. I mean, I think there's a difference between the way we retinally deal with the image and then the way that we um, sonically deal with sound. To simplify, I think that the image is optic and that the sound engages the physical body. And so the way music grabs you, you know, the way Third Uncle, that piece grabs you viscerally in your gut, in your just held, that was really exciting to me on a formal level, apart from the politics or the content of the work, is how to kind of dance when you're editing, how to make a piece of um, cutting with a pick both the, um, the cut points. I was very concerned in this body of work of not just the cut points landing on the beat, but the internal motion of the shot within the cut points responding to the musical rhythm. So there's a, there's a sort of um, polyrhythmic um, or polyphonic kind of element in the piece where there's one kind of um, rhythm that's being imposed by the actual cut points, particularly in third note nest because there are no dissolves, it's all straight cuts. Um, and then there's a secondary rhythm that emerges from the movement from within shot to shot relationships. Um, and a lot of ways the kind of balance between the content, the political content and the formal content is um, equally engaging. Comments, questions, thoughts? Yes? Uh, I was um, curious, like, what's your particular interest in uh, Moybridge? And what made you decide to actually draw all this stuff by hand? You know, uh, it's hard to actually, I and mean, I think a lot of ways, many of us have that kind of, um, I, don't, I don't know, many people I know who are attracted to Moybridge have, you know, for all kinds of the invention of, you know, the first motion studies, the link of still photography to the advent of cinematic motion, all of those kind of things. Mine really came from kind of, it was all those things were interesting about the optics of the work. But I also had a kind of um, speculative portraiture aspect. Who were these people? You know, when you start to look at the Moybridge Motion Studies, you recognize, oh my god, there's the guy with the mustache who's carrying the weight and who does a bunch of things. Or, but oh wait, that woman only appears once who bathes. Or that woman only appears once who smokes. Um, I also was really interested in the kind of gendered aspect to Moybridge, intensely gendered. So for the most part, you know, men did manly things and women didn't. But then when you start really look at Moybridge and start falling apart, there are many, many contradictions. I mean, this is late 19th century, and he has a woman naked, putting her feet up and smoking, which I found so, oh my god, look at that image. So a lot of it was a kind of that, the idea of who are the characters, what does it mean to bring them to life? Um, and also then is that the idea of trying to um, free associate from a period of time. One of the parameters, before I even knew I was making these about Oscar Wilde, I started looking at the advent of cinema. I was thinking a lot about um, 1890 to 1910. So, okay, I want to make a piece that deals with the time between roughly 1870 and 1915. That's all the source material I want to work with. I don't know what that is. So Moybridge and Natchez sort of rose to the surface. And then Oscar Wilde, The Ballad of Reading Jow, became a thing that it got um, organized around, ultimately and thematically, the kind of um, prison that these loops presented, these people perpetually trapped in walking and walking and walking and walking and carrying and carrying and carrying, also seemed to have a kind of pathos to me. Um, but they're frozen in a kind of, um, you know, permanent loop. Yeah. I have a question about uh, queer cinema in general. Um, now, I'm familiar with your work now, and also Robert Cameron, who's also a friend of mine um, when I was living in Indiana, who's also a filmmaker. And there seems to be a common thread between uh, all three of your uh, works in terms of the use of text on the screen, um, of boxes, so to speak, uh, and 
other aesthetic things of that nature that seem to be um, a, a common thread throughout uh, all three of your, your works. <coughs> Excuse me, he's relatively unknown as far as I understand. So um, uh, I'm, I'm curious as to, uh, is that, uh, and also the superposition of images, like uh, several layers. And, um, I, I want to bring that back to like, the first time I, I think that's ever appeared in cinema is a John Borman film called Zardoz in the late 60s, right after he did um, Deliverance. Uh, I don't know if there's a connection between that being the first time that was ever used and queer cinema, uh, or uh, is what what might be. I mean, it's funny, I think, first of all, the, the notion of queer cinema, as I've come to understand it, has really been tied, it's, it's become a kind of very broad, broadly defined rubric that includes any work that engages in an identity way with lesbian, gay, you know, what I, what I lovingly call the BLT community, more correctly, the LGBT, whatever it is, but I like to call the BLT community because it amuses me more. Um, and so when the, the term, there was a term, new queer cinema, that was introduced by a critic named B. Ruby Rich. That happened in 1992. It coincided with Sundance in 1992, in which Swoon was played. There was a movie directed by Greg Araki called The Living End, from the Greg, uh, Craig, uh, Chris Munch called The Hours and the Times. The previous year, Todd Haynes had brought Poison, and Derek Jarman was at Sundance in 1992 with Edward II. So there was a panel considering new queer cinema. And New Queer Cinema, in that definition, was um, galvanized a lot around genre filmmaking. Filmmakers who were revisiting the notion of genre forms in order to critique the notion of storytelling itself. So, you know, one of the reasons I'm drawn to the melodrama or the policier, you know, the de detective story, is not just because I like melodramas and police stories, but because I want to draw attention to the notion of storytelling itself. I think after that initial wave, which was very narrowly focused, very myopic, actually, to sort of define this movement around these narrative works, a lot of us were like bristled and said, please, for God's sake, there was a tradition that well precedes us, you know, that goes back to Kenneth Anger or any number of experimental filmmakers, both in the United States and at large. And by defining it so narrowly around narrative work, it obliterates the connections and relationships between all this other work. So now queer cinema, I think, has become a kind of very fluid notion in terms of how it's defined. Queer, even in this, as a term, has become um, incredibly broad. So there's a collective called LTTR in New York. Um, what does LTTR stand for? Lesbians that, does anyone know what the acronym stands for? Anyways, it's a young group of um, makers, and they are not all sodomites. They are not all actually homosexuals. They're not all lesbians, but they identify as queer, which to me is completely intriguing. It's a kind of post-identity notion of queerness. Mm -hmm. So this queerness, I mean, is, you know, one of the things I found very troubling around the release of Savage Grace, the feature that I just directed, is that it's described as a new, as a, as a middle-aged new queer cinema. And I was like, is it a queer movie? <laughs> Why? Because I'm homosexual? Because one of the characters in the film is homosexual? I think there's a, a kind of world of difference between yeah. um, the experimental work I made, Swoon, or Savage Grace. So personally speaking, to really specifically answer your question, though I, when I see the work of Barbara and others, who are, you know, considered to be colleagues and peers and whose work I really admire, and I see the formal connection, I always marvel at it. Because I wonder, is it just in the air? Have we studied the same body of work? In terms of my own reference, a lot of the, um, especially the idea of using text over image, comes from the fact that my master's degree was in photography. So I studied conceptual and language-based photography. That's really my work where a lot of the work came out of. And as I became more knowledgeable about experimental work, those connections started to be forged. But I don't know that there's really, I mean, that's, I, and I think maybe that's an interesting project for somebody yeah, to do it's critically. It's like uncanny. It's, but, I mean, the resemblance between uh, the styles. I mean, yours is obviously uh, different than theirs in, in certain ways. But uh, there's, it's, it's really quite interesting how it's a, a formalized style almost. That's one of the great things of being, uh, the difference between being maybe a maker and a scholar or a critic. Because as a maker, I have a ground level view. Yeah. So when I look at my colleagues, I just see them from my own sight line. Whereas a critic or a historian, a historian tends to have an omniscient view. They can look and say, oh, and look at all of Barbara's work and all of my work and say, look, there are these connections, there are these affinities between the two bodies of work. I have to say I'm somewhat blind to that. Um, 
in part because I don't really, I, have, I don't study the work of my peers in the sense of um, like looking side to side and seeing what people are doing and how it uh, relates to what I'm doing. I actually try to watch the work of my peers and colleagues as an audience member. Um, and so take pleasure in And sometimes, of course, are, I'm inspired by or um, adopt strategies of other filmmakers, absolutely. My work's for sure, I mean, among other things, indebted to the tradition of experimental cutting and um, filmmaking that goes back to Stan Brakhage and the Boer, really goes back to the kind of invention of a certain kind of experimental filmmaking. So as much as a reference to um, queer work, my, my work has an equal reference to a kind of formalist work. So it has nothing to do with Zardoz's work? No, not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that you bring that to the table. That's one of, I think I'm a big, a big believer in that meaning is made in the, the eyes of the audience. And that um, I think that uh, the audience, I've now become comfortable enough with the work I make that you can like my work, dislike my work, engage with it, not engage with it, and all of those are interesting reactions to me. Um, and that I, I learn enormously when I show work to people because it gets reflected back and people see and say, I'm sure all of you who make things have this experience of the interpretation, interpretation of your work by others and how that animates it into life. Let's go.